Well, thank you. So it's my pleasure to introduce George Moore, who really has an extraordinary background. For those of you who are nuclear engineering, you can see what they could possibly end with in this career. I think it's unlikely. Um, George is a graduate of the Naval Academy, and he has a master's and PhD in nuclear engineering in Berkeley, and later he got a law degree at Paul Law School. Um, he's worked as a uh, in the nuclear uh, weapons area in Barnes Livermore. He's worked as a private attorney and he's worked in IEEA safeguards. So he's a career, he's still trying to figure out what he wants to do. And for a number of years now, he's been at the uh, at the Middlebury Institute. He teaches a variety of courses related to uh, the security, cyber security, he's a lecturer in cyber security, he wants to live more in other places. So he really has done it all. We're going to focus today on this issue of safeguards and verification of agreements, which is crucially important to uh, the nuclear non-proliferation agenda. Please welcome George Bush. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for the nice introduction, Michael. Uh, let me just correct one thing. At IAEA, I was the senior analyst in the Office of Nuclear Security, which is now the Division of Nuclear Security. So uh, I dealt with the safeguards people, but kind of at arm's length. We'll talk a little bit more about that, because I'd like you to understand the relationship of safeguards within the agency. So here's what I'd like to do tonight. And by the way, interrupt whenever you feel you have a question. Don't wait till the end. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history, uh, history leading up to safeguards. Uh, and what I'd really like to come away with is an understanding of the different safeguards regimes. It's not all one color. It's not all related to the non-proliferation treaty. So uh, it's a system of accounting and control to ensure that certain types of materials are kept in peaceful use, not, the, not diverted from peaceful use. The IAEA is not like the NRC on a global basis or Department of Energy. It is not a regulatory operation. So if you have some conception that IAEA inspectors go out and say, don't do that, that's not correct. And we'll talk about that as we go along. All right. So IAEA itself is an independent international organization. It is not some subunit of UN in New York. It has its own director general, Yuki Omano, uh, just like the IAEA has Ban Ki-moon, or excuse me, the UN has Ban Ki-moon. Uh, Amano is in his second term. He's about to run out of his second term. The structure of the IAEA, I don't want to go into too much detail about that, but under the director general, of course, he's got his staff in his office, there are Deputy Director General, DDGs. And the three principal DDGs are Safeguards, which is the large 800 pound gorilla within the agency. It's got the most people, it's got the most assets, it's got the most money. Then there's safety and security, which are grouped together. Then there's technical cooperation. And technical cooperation deals with providing nuclear science to the member states of the IAEA. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Then there are a couple of other minor DDGs, for example, the personnel department, human resources has their own DDG. Those are the kind of the, the lower level DDGs. But under the DDGs are different departments and divisions, and it all breaks down from there. I spent five years there, and at the end of five years, I was still wasn't sure of how exactly everything worked, which is not unfair. Okay, so here's the problem that the agency set up to deal with. You know that the war ended, we dropped a couple of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, the U.S. is the only nuclear power. The United Nations formed, you know that if you go over to San Francisco, you can see where the U.N. was organized. Uh, so how can they control these new nuclear weapons? Well, they founded the United Nations Atomic Energy Commission. So doesn't that have a familiar ring? You know, the U.S. has the Atomic Energy Commission. The UN has the Atomic Energy Commission. The UN AEC no longer exists. In fact, it went defunct in uh, 1952 and was disbanded. So kind of the successor 
to the UNAEC is more or less the IAEA. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So what happened here was they never could get past the fundamental disagreements between the Soviet Union and the U.S. and U.S. And U.S. writ large, U.S. U.K. Uh, there were a couple of proposals, but the interesting thing is that the first terms of reference, these are the organizing documents, and then what, what they're supposed to do, starts right away with the idea of safeguards. This idea of controlling material and technology. So soon after the war, even though the U.S. is the only nuclear power, the U.N. member states are thinking about safeguarding for elimination of national armaments, of atomic weapons, and all the major weapons, so on and so forth. You probably have, I'm sure, Michael, you guys have talked about the Baruch plan uh, and Asheson Ashes and Lilienthal report, et cetera, et cetera. Everything was blocked by the USSR. In fact, the Korean War would never have started, probably. Or not. The UN would not have been involved in responding to the Korean War, except for the fact that the USSR representative made a serious error at the Security Council, got up and walked out. And that allowed the remaining members of the Security Council to pass a resolution to uh, assist South Korea. Okay, so this is a little bit more history. Cold War becomes a controlling feature on international diplomacy. UK goes nuclear, add us for peace. This is Eisenhower, is add us for peace. This all falls into the idea of we're going to release information that we have about this mystical uh, nuclear stuff, and we're going to start putting this out. IAEA is actually formed in 1957, shortly thereafter, France goes nuclear, China goes nuclear. And here's the big thing, and this is the big tie-in to safeguards to a certain degree, the non-proliferation treaty. Three years of development goes into effect in 1970. If I go the right way, I'll get the wrong one. Okay, so the IAEA, arguably replacement for the defunct UNAEC. Somebody's got to do something. There's no longer a UNAEC, they've got to do something. Statute of the IAEA. This is what the governing structure of the IAEA is. Article 3 authorizes establishment of safeguards and to apply them at the request of parties to an international instrument or at the request of the state. Remember this. Parties to an international instrument. So what comes to mind immediately right now? JCPOA. Other instruments where they can request that the IAEA be involved. Um, I have one of our students here who's an intern out of Livermore now, Maggie Arno. And Maggie, unfortunately, missed the meeting we had in Vienna. But she was part of a practicum where some of our students from Monterey went to the Czech Republic and spent two weeks at the research reactor and various reactors in, uh, in Czechoslovakia. But we spent a day at the IAEA and safeguards people said, a question came up about the JCPOA and they said, it's not safeguards. We don't know exactly what it is, but it's not safeguards. Because the IAEA is being asked to do a number of things which are kind of outside its experience. And that can cause some problems. Talk about that later. Okay. Set up safeguards program with staff and inspectors. And if you go back to the early days of the agency, the agency is now out at the Vienna International Center on the other side of the Danube. But before that, it was in an old hotel down in the ring, the ring in Vienna. I'm not sure what that means. But, uh, so the way the IAEA does business is it issues information circuits. Insert is the term. Insert 26. In 1961, applied safeguards to research, test, and power reactors less than 100 megawatts thermal. Now, that's to all the members of the IAEA. Remember, NPT doesn't come until 1970. Insert 66 and 67 established pre NPT safeguards. So, even though India, for example, is not an NPT member, Things in India are, there are facilities in India which come under the original safeguards under answer 66. So there's only about three, but I don't want to confuse with the numbers, you know, three, maybe four, if you throw in 
the WF doc we'll see in a minute. It's important to understand this concept. They apply to shapes that are not sign the MPK. Okay. What about Korea? North Korea. Did it sign the MPK? Yeah. yeah. Withdrew. There's questions about its withdrawal, but that's kind of a nitpicky point that you know, theorists like to argue about. In practical reality, it's gone. It's not going to come back. Uh, but the pre MPT safeguards do rely on the states to declare the facilities. So there's no you know, state level inspection of facilities in India. Uh, and we'll go on to see why there's some problems with that. So the NVP requires states to accept safeguards on all nuclear materials per Article 3. What's a nuclear material? How would you define a nuclear material? Well, you guys are better. You know, of course, almost over. Somebody must have a good definition for this. There probably aren't any good definitions for it because there are various definitions which you'll find in various places. Uh, for example, you'll find one definition in Article 20 of the statute of the IAEA, except it doesn't call it nuclear material, because it calls it special fissionable material and source material. Now, in the United States, we like to use the term special nuclear material. What does that mean? Well, they not made the same thing as nuclear material. And the source and special nuclear material doesn't cover everything from which you can make a nuclear weapon. So that might be a problem. Uh, so along with the NPT comes the major thing, insert 153. And that defines the agreements, the general outline agreements, between the states and the IAEA pursuant to the NPT. So there are members of the IAEA. Most of the members of the IAEA are, are members of the NPT, but there are members of the IAEA, such as India, Pakistan, etc., who are not under the NPT. Each one of these agreements These are each specific agreements. You can think of them as contracts between the agency and a particular state. It's not that there's just one overall agreement. There are individual agreements between, like for example, the IAEA and the Czech Republic, the IAEA and the Federal Republic of Germany, et cetera. And this is what's referred to as comprehensive safeguards. So when groups like the nuclear suppliers group say, we're not allowed, or our members are not allowed to transfer certain types of materials to a country unless it has comprehensive safeguards. What they're talking about is insert 153 safeguards. But there's some problems with 153. First of all, what it does, one of the things it does is set up a state system of accounting and control, the SSAC, to cover these materials. Now, these materials are not the same materials that are covered for nuclear security under insert 225, revision five, which is a non-binding document. They're not the same materials that are covered under the uh, uh, Convention on the Physical Protection of Different Materials or the 2005 amendment there too. So you have, the devil's in the details with these definitions. You really have to read the documents to find out what's covered. For example, is you mine some uranium out of the ground. Is that safeguarded? Yes, no, 50-50 chance. Pick, pick your pick, which, which is it? Is ore safeguarded? Well, it's kind of a tricky question because it's not safeguarded. We don't apply safeguards to it unless it's being shipped internationally. So then it's supposed to be reported under the safeguard system, transfer. So other elements of Answer 153 are it's a rather new unit to me. Our information and access. In other words, the states are supposed to provide the IAEA access to do inspections. They're supposed to provide information about their holdings. 
States make an initial declaration, which is verified by inspection. So here's the situation. Iraq, under Saddam Hussein, makes a declaration. They say, here's what we have. IAEA inspectors come down to Iraq. They inspect what the Iraqis say is there. They say, good, you have everything there. They can't say, well, what's in that building over there? That's outside their scope under 153. So this is one of the problems with insert 153 and with this level of safeguards. So one important definition, which you know, one of the things you might want to take away from this, is an agency definition of a significant quantity. Because if I had, you know, I could be relatively wealthy if I had some money, an anomalous sum of money, let's say 20 bucks for every document I've ever seen, which is misused the term significant quantity or SQ. There's a long technical definition of SQ, and it's defined in a number of different ways. It's defined for uranium 233, 235, and plutonium. It's basically not the amount, the minimum amount that is needed to make a nuclear weapon, and that's the way it's really hot. I don't know if you guys are hot, but I'm going to get on the jacket here. Nobody gets excited about that. Uh, it's the amount that if it is, if you have a separated quantity of these materials, the agency will say you have enough material to have a weapons program. There are actually numbers assigned to this, and the easiest ones to remember are 25 kilograms for U-235, 8 kilograms for plutonium. Well, if you look at what the DOE has, the Department of Energy has said publicly, you can make a nuclear weapon with 4 kilograms of plutonium. So why is an SQ 8 kilograms? Because this was defined a long time ago. The number for 233 is the same as 235. Nobody is currently making weapons out of 233, but you could. It's good stuff. It's about the same as 235. There's some questions about this. So if you want to read about the problems with significant quantity, there's an article you can Google. Uh, look for John Cochran. Uh, Cochran's a physicist with, ah, I want to say, not the Union of Concerned Scientists. It's NRDC. A, NRDC. It's Tom Cochran. Tom Cochran. I'm sorry. John Cochran's a guy I used to hire. He's the head of the, was the head of the Aero Engineering Department at the University of Ottawa. Uh, so, this number is a political football because inspection frequencies for safeguards are set up based on the time that is estimated it would take to divert an SQ. So, you want to detect the diversion of an SQ. Now, if you have the plutonium, if you went from eight to four, you'd have to double the inspection frequency. Because, you know, whatever, assuming everything's linear, whatever they can separate or, or cheat out of the system or reprocess and get eight, and I can do four and a half the time, so you'd have to inspect twice as frequently. And it's a big political football. So if you look at the Tom Cochran publication, you'll get a good idea about that. If you want to read about U-233 and why this is the wrong number, uh, read a publication by Harry Bantine, B-A-N-T-I-N-E, which you can find. Uh, Harry Bantine is one of the uh, primary uh, weapons. He designed primary weapon systems at, uh, at once the remote lab. It's a key division there. It's by Bantine, an equivalent person from Los Alamos, whose name I can't remember, and somebody from Oak Ridge. So that's a publicly available doc. So, this is a key element, and this is something that people forget. Safeguards is to detect the diversion. It's not a system designed to prevent diversion. Okay? It may prevent it in that people are afraid that their diversion is going to be detected, but it is not a system which locks everything up, and you know the IAEA has the key and nobody else can open it up. It's a system designed to detect diversion material. And if you look at goals and aims, which is in paragraph 28 of insert 153, you'll 
find the sort of information. A couple of other things that tie to safeguards. Safeguards is tied to export control because of the Zanger Committee. Uh, Zanger is a uh, Swiss um, uh, nuclear policy person. Uh, this committee is still in existence. This creates a trigger list of items. And if an item is on the trigger list, the members of, and there are about 30 some or maybe 40 members of the Zanger Committee, they are not supposed to export that item until they are assured that safeguards are in, in place in the receiving country to adequately safeguard that material. Similar idea for the nuclear suppliers group. And this is the way these, although these are not officially tied to safeguards in the sense that there's a direct tie to the IEA, and they're very closely tied in the real world. Uh, the India-US agreement, our, uh, I'm from the James Martin Institute down at Middlebury Monterey. Our director, Bill Potter, will tell you that the India-US deal, uh, probably the one thing that's undercut the NPT the most seriously since its inception. A very good critic of the India US arrangement. So we could spend another couple of hours talking about the India US arrangement. But basically, what we gave India were all the rights and privileges under the NPT. In return, the Indians promised to allow safeguarding of facilities. But it's a bilateral agreement. This is what we call a one, two, three agreement. The US one, two, three agreements are bilateral agreements. Now, the French and some other countries have agreements with India, which also allow them to do business with India. But it puts it totally outside the NPT framework, and that may not be good for the overall life of the non-proliferation regime. So, uh, anything else to say about the uh, US 123 agreement? Uh, it's a very curious thing. Uh, INSERP 225 is the oldest nuclear security agreement. This is how, in contrast to safeguards, which is we want to know whether the material is there, nuclear security deals with protecting the material. So INSERT 225, agency document, currently is revision five. It is designed to provide, and we'll talk a little bit later about the criteria categorization under that, to provide security for the material. But it is not mandatory. It's just a guidance. Now, the Convention on the Physical Protection of, Nuc of Nuclear Material, the CPPNM, picks up that guidance and turns it for those members of this, the people who ratify the CPPNM, which up until recently was not the United States, uh, turns it into a binding document. That, but under the US bilateral agreements, almost all of our bilateral agreements say you agree to implement INSERT 225. So it becomes a binding document for those people who have, or those states that have signed bilateral agreements with the US. And it gets into how do you write agreements? Because many of the bilateral agreements go back to INSERT 225 revision two. So what happens when revision five comes along? Revision three, revision four. You have to have a method within the document that allows, and the typical way to do that is to say both parties have to agree that the document will be updated to reflect the newest revisions. So there are some states who say, no, we're not going to accept revision three under the bilateral one, two, three agreement. So when the one, two, three agreement times out, then we can go back and say, you didn't do it, or we're not going to do business with you. But that's a tricky <coughs> Okay, there is what's called a small quantities protocol. This is a government, this is a board of governors document. It's not an answer. It's another way the agency does business. And this is designed for states with small holdings. If you only have a couple of kilograms of uranium-235 for experimental purposes, why should you go through all this stuff that countries that have nuclear power programs and you know reprocessing facilities and things like that? Why should you go through all that? So this is a a way of shortcutting the system. You still have to have an accountability system, but a lot of paperwork is eliminated and they just make an annual report. 
And sometimes the agency verifies that, sometimes they don't. It's kind of like, you know, why are we going to spend a lot of time sending people to trace down 50 grams of uranium-235? Sometimes they do it just for the exercise equipment. So what happened, uh, everybody then has 153 agreements. Then, latter part of the last century, we started running into problems. They found out that, oh my gosh, some of these people with clandestine programs, they didn't declare these facilities. And, you know, uh, several of the former director generals were kind of shocked by that, uh, which was a little bit disturbing. But <laughs> the system was being gained, and safeguards under 153 might not be sufficient. Remember what was going on under 153. The state declares, here's what we have. The IAEA sends inspectors to those places. One thing that you ought to understand, too, states have the right not to refuse inspection, but they have the right to refuse individual inspectors. So if they don't want anybody from the United States or from the UK or from France or from India or from Pakistan or anybody who knows anything about nuclear weapons coming there, they can say that. Eventually, they have to have certain time limits that they have to agree to getting people in. But this is what triggered MSERC 540. This defines what's called a model additional protocol. You probably heard a lot about that. Uh, expands the information statements provided, allows for inspection of the total fuel cycle. Basically, this transitions from inspection of facilities or facilities oriented safeguards to state level inspection. In other words, you're looking at the entire state and what they're doing. You're looking at what they're shipping in. You're looking at all sorts of things. And this has caused some problems. You know, a lot of states, even though they may have a model protocol, they don't like the idea that the agency kind of sits there in Vienna, looks at things, looks at satellite imagery, looks at all sorts of things, and asks probing questions. It also, and this is a key thing, allows for environmental sampling. So at CyberZorg outside Vienna, the agency has a big laboratory for, among other things, analyzing environmental samples which come back from all over the world. Now, the other, one of the other agencies located at the DIC is the Preparatory Commission for the uh, Convention on uh, me, CTBT, uh, Convention Test Ban Treaty. Uh, comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization. But it's not the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization because that hasn't gone into effect. So it's not the preparatory commission for that. It acts as if it was in effect. And they have a whole array of international monitoring systems. But that's not what this is about. This is environmental sampling, like the agency has a right to go and set up an air monitor and sample air you know, near some facility to see if the facility is working. That sort of thing. See what's coming out. See if anything strange is coming out. So, for just as a comment, one of the biggest shocks to me when I came here five, uh, five and a half years ago, became chair, is that the additional protocol reaches down to every nuclear engineering department in the U.S. because there's an annual roll. So every January, Jeff Pickle, some of you know, who's our uh, safety uh, manager now, is going to be Dolan, has to run around talk to all the faculty. Uh, get a catalog of any special material, and it's even uh, uh, codes for modeling a fuel cycle. It's not even just uh, material yeah. as well. And you can tear your hair on. He's got by January 31, this all has to be sent into the State Department. Yeah. Ties this into the Knox. The, the U.S. cooperates on safeguards. The nuclear weapon states are not bound to cooperate on their safeguards. But we do. We do. So does the U.K. It's a good example, I mean, trying to set a good example. may not be that influential, and as uh, Carl just said, uh, it does cause a lot of stuff. And back in the Obama administration, uh, there was an unfortunate, uh, somebody released a lot of the collected data inadvertently, went to the public. You have to understand that safeguards data is really treated confidentially. It's between the state and the IAEA. And it's not just within the state and the IAEA, it's the state and safeguards within the IAEA. As a officer, nuclear security officer, I could not go and 
just get access to safeguards data. If there was a reason that the safeguards people wanted to talk to me about safeguards data, they could come and talk to me and say, you know, you swear you're not going to talk about this stuff in a blah, blah, blah. You know, put me through the whole ringer. It's, it's security, it's just like the US system. We have IAEA, safeguards confidential, safeguards secret, safeguards top secret, etc. But that information is really closely controlled. Having said that, it's kind of a common assumption that the IAEA is very leaky and that many of the people in safeguards have some sort of ties to intelligence agencies in the countries which they come from. You have to sign a declaration that you will not, you know, release any information. But that's kind of an assumption that a lot of people do. do that. Uh, so how are safeguards done? Well, um, this is the time I get to make a little pitch about uh, coming to the International Safeguards course, which we run in Monterey uh, first week in June. Uh, you're too late for this year, but if you're a first year student or second year student, whatever program you're in, you can apply next year. We've got one person coming from Berkeley. I'm not sure, is it is one of the people in the room here? Anybody here coming to the Safeguards course? I can't remember the name of the person. We've got one, one Berkeley attendee. Uh, so, the way they do this, primary thing, it's through inspections. Physically, inspectors going out to these places, going into the facility, and that causes some problems. They come to an operating power reactor, and they want to look at the spent fuel pool and count the number of fuel rods, and they want to run monitors down the fuel rods to make sure that they're not dummy fuel rods, that they're actually fuel that's been irradiated. A lot of things are put under camper-resistant seals, now that's not, you can't, they're just lead and wire seals. They're a very special type of lead and wire seal. It's difficult to fake, it's difficult to open and, and reseal, but they're not gonna stop anybody. You can take a pair of wire cutters and cut them off and do whatever you want with the material. You know, inspectors leave, you can do whatever. But some facilities have real-time monitoring. This means cameras, you know, that are streaming data back to the beginning uh, so that, you know, if they're cutting the locks, you should be able to see the people cutting the locks. But they're probably bright enough to, to kill the cameras before they cut the locks. You know, like watching some television program. Uh, non destructive assaying methods. Uh, primarily, like passive gamma, you know, high purity germanium systems, uh, good, uh, uh, good sodium iodide, thermal lanthanum bromides, and other um, higher resolution solid state detectors. Kind of the, not the new kid on the block anymore, it's 10 year old technology. Uh, are mechanically cooled uh, high purity germanium detectors. They, they like those. Uh, you can take them out, set them up, chill them down, and do really good spectroscopy. Um, and intelligence like activities. So they are looking at overhead stuff. Are they tied to intelligence services? No, not classically. But member states can provide intelligence to the IAEA. Of course, when they do that, then you know, that's no longer secure. Uh, but they can do that. They can provide uh, uh, intelligence about things. If you look at things like Al Kabir and Syrian reported Syrian reactor, uh, other things where countries, the intelligence agencies, have provided information to the IAEA for the IAEA to follow up on. So if you're a photo analyst, it's a good place to work. Um, they buy commercial imagery. Um, kind of cool stuff. So if I haven't said this at least three or four times, uh, doesn't prevent, raises awareness. But there's some loopholes. The NP, this is in the NPT. You can use material, nuclear material, for military purposes. You take it out of safeguards. What kind of military purposes are you use it for? Nuclear propulsion, military satellites. How many satellites with reactors are orbiting the Earth right now? Do they know? Do they want to take a guess? Anybody not asleep? <laughs> well, it comes to a shock as a shock for some people, but there are Reactors still orbiting. Uh, the Soviet Union used to have a very active program in radar ocean reconnaissance satellites. Those were powered by uh, reactors, Ramashka reactors, and later, I don't know what the later version was. Uh, 
They flew in low Earth orbit because in low Earth orbit, that gives you the best signal return from the radars on board. They needed a reactor because solar power uh, and RTGs were not, couldn't provide enough power for the radar systems. So at the end of their useful life in low Earth orbit, they boosted up to a high parking orbit to decay. So there's dozens of them up there now. Unfortunately, two of them came back in. They didn't boost, so their orbit degraded. One was Cosmos 954, which came back in and scattered itself over the Grace Lake Lake Canada. This was in, in Google it. 1979, 1979, 1980, that time. And there was a U.S. Canadian recovery team. Anybody look for that? Cosmos 954, come up with a date. So, uh, you know, what was the Soviet response? Do you know where that came from? <laughs> I don't know anything about it. So there's this big operation up in Canada doing this, looking for the remnants of the reactor, it actually laid a couple hundred mile long swath along the Great Slave Lake, which was frozen over at the time. Uh, all these teams are up there in helicopters, they're going around, they're doing things, and they run into four guys who are trekking across Canada with bug sleds. And the guys say, hey, we found this really weird thing. It later became known as the Amherst, this control rod drive system, and it was highly contaminated. And that's how they found their biggest piece, not, not from their efforts and their air search and that sort of thing. You know, four kind of weird guys walk across from Canada. Uh, later, a couple of years later, uh, another one failed to boost, and that was going to come down in Central Europe, which would have been kind of exciting, except on the last pass, it skipped. It was ripping off parts. This is not a thing designed to re-enter. So it was ripping off parts and it skipped on the atmosphere made another orbit, came down in the middle of the Indian Ocean, it's never seen it. So it came down. But in Canada, most of the things were little you know, fuel particles. Uh, so nuclear-powered submarines are the big users of this nuclear propulsion uh, of non-weapons military use, which is allowed. It's allowed under the NPT. So you occasionally would hear around say, we want to enrich to high enrichment levels because we're going to build a nuclear submarine. Okay. Although they haven't, they've built a couple of like little mini subs. They have no ability to do that. But right now, the Brazilians are building a nuclear submarine. They've been building it for a while. They're being assisted by the French. And that's going to prove a quantity for the safeguards people because nobody has exactly figured out how they're going to handle this removal of material from safeguards, put it in the submarine, make sure it comes back under safeguards control. And Submarine has to be either refueled or used its useful lines. So, other things, it doesn't count for non state actors. This is all states. Now, there aren't a lot of non state actors that have nuclear material, hopefully. Hopefully, there are none. But remember, we're in kind of a new world with cyber and a number of other things where you have areas which have substantial non state actors which nobody really controls. They're not under treaties and not under agreements. And it doesn't cover all weapons and materials. Anything basically that you can define a critical mass for, you can make a weapon out of. You can't make a very good weapon out of stuff. How many of you think, show hands, you know, this is kind of hard, you don't have to speak, just show your hands. How many people think that you cannot build a plutonium gun device? Everybody know what a plutonium gun device is? How many people think you cannot build a plutonium gun device? How many people think you can build a plutonium gun device? What happens if you build a plutonium gun device? It doesn't work very well, right? It's going to create an issue. But you can build one, and if you go back to the Manhattan Project, there were three basic designs. Three. Three basic designs. There was Fat Man, which is the implosion system. There was Little Boy, the uranium gun device. And there was Thin Man. And Thin Man was a plutonium gun device. And why? Why did they think they could build a plutonium gun device? Because the first plutonium that they had came from accelerators, not from reactors. So the plutonium-240 content was lower, a lot lower. And they didn't realize the problem they were going to have with plutonium-240 before you really start seeing the reactor produce stuff. Yeah, that's, that's why they've got a problem. So anyway, moving on. Safeguards is in safety. 
and it was in security. In other words, the safeguards inspectors, this is a bit exaggerated, the safeguards inspectors could walk into the facility, ensure that everything's there, the seals are in place, and if the guards are all asleep and you know, the gates are open, that's not their job. And I've got a picture of an armadillo where somebody striped the road over the top of the dead armadillo. It ain't my job, okay? Not my job to pick up armadillos, my job to strike the road. If there's an armadillo, that's too bad. Uh, and it is security. These are basically separate aspects of the IAEA program. Uh, the agency calls this the three S concept. Safety, security, safeguards. Or I gave a presentation at the Institute for Nuclear Materials Management on the system involved. Six years ago, I give one pretty much every year, but this one was about six years ago. At that time, the DDG for safeguards was Herman Nappitz. He was in the back of the room, standing room only. Not because my talk was all that popular, but because it's a very small room. You have to be standing in the back. And I put up a slide and had the three S's, security, safety, safeguard. And he kind of looked at me and said, well, you know, if uh, EDG Nackers, if I were one of his people, it would be safeguards, security, and safety, because safeguards is definitely a big play. We've already talked about the fact that it has its own classification system. And it totally controls its own information. It doesn't come out of statements. So, okay. Now, what does safeguards not deal with? It doesn't deal with all those other radioactive materials out there. And we like to use the term, the agency likes to use the term, other radioactive materials. Because the nuclear materials are radioactive. So if you say radioactive materials, that's a little ambiguous. Other radioactive materials are those things other than whatever you define nuclear materials as being. These are the things that are useful for a dispersal device or a simple exposure, exposure device. In other words, if you've got a big cesium-137 source that was hidden in the middle of the room, you know, all the people in the middle of the room would be in big problems. These are covered somewhat loosely by the agency code of conduct for radioactive sources. And a lot of people think that that covers everything. It only covers seal sources and only covers certain categories of seal sources. And doesn't deal with a lot of issues, and it's all voluntary anyway. There's no equivalent to safeguards for all these other things. There are guidelines from safety. There are guidelines from security. There is no enforcement ability for the safety or security guidelines, with one exception. If you do not correspond with safety guidelines, not security, because security is a latecomer in all this. This is kind of post 9 11 stuff. If you don't correspond with safety guidelines, then you're not supposed to be eligible for tech cooperation funds. <clears throat> okay, but that's kind of loosely done, and they don't always enforce that. Uh, these are the categories of the categorization table for other radioactive materials. This is not applied. This is, comes from a document, RSG 1.9. Five categories. One is the, the bad actor here. This, these are the big sources. These are things that might have 10,000 curies or 20,000 curies of activity. And they're all defined with, you know, scientists always lie, so I'll tell you why I'm lying here in a minute. They're generally defined by an A over B ratio, where A is the activity you have, B is a tabular value, which is tabulated for most of the radionuclides of interest. So you go in a table, and if the D value is one curie, and what you have is 100, well, then that puts you in category two because the A over D value would be 100. Notice I picked something that's got an easy math to work with. And that would be a category two source. This is the way most people think of it. But they're, unfortunately, they threw in some suggestions for upgrading and downgrading, some subjective ways of doing the categorization. The one that it affects most is category two because they kind of suggest that all gamma radiography sources, these are sources that are used for like pipeline inspection, they're, they're radiation-driven x-ray cameras, if you want to think of them that way, uh, that they should be in category two because those get stolen and lost a lot. The one thing that gets stolen the most and lost the most is down here in category four, and high category four are moisture density gauges. Uh, any construction site around here, you'll probably find now a moisture density gauge has a cesium 137 source in it and an amber reaching beryllium neutron source. And that can get exciting when they get lost because even though they're not really all that dangerous, they draw a lot of attention. 
Okay, I'm good. Uh, this is how nuclear material is categorized. So you've got the material type, you've got the form, and you've got categories which are by mass. Okay, so you know, kind of neat. Below 15 grams is non-category three. So you have you have to go down here. It says quantities not falling in category three and natural uranium depleted uranium. And thorium should be protected at least in conformance with prudent management practices. What's a prudent management practice? Well, it'll go a long way to try and figure that out because it's not defined anymore. Okay. Now, this table looks almost identical to what you find in the CPPM, except that down here in their footnote C, there's no thorium. And why do you suppose that is? Who's the big interest in thorium? Thorium fuel cycle. Yeah, with India. India, sure. They wouldn't agree to have any. There's also an exemption for plutonium, plutonium 238. If the, if the plutonium 238 content is more than 80%, who has the big interest in plutonium 238? The big. No, Russia sells it. They sell it to us. We use it for RTG. Okay. Now it has a critical mass. You can find the Los Alamos publication shows you the critical mass. It's also crummy stuff. It's really hot. It's physically hot. It's radioactive. It's a relatively short half life. Alpha emitter. It's very good for RTGs. These are we call them nuclear batteries. So great stuff for that. We put up large amounts. The Apollo missions had large amounts of plutonium-238, more than enough to make a weapon. Wow. Enough to make a weapon. Uh, when I was in graduate school down here, uh, we saw some stuff about the power generation from an RPG that was going on one of the missions. And we whoa, that's got to, you know, we use the technical term, hey, that's loaded stuff in it. So we called up to Space Sciences Lab and said, what do you guys know about RTGs that we don't know? Because this would have a lot of stuff in it. And they started laughing and said, yeah, you're right. It has a lot of stuff in it. All those recovery teams that are down in Florida, the people think are there to recover the astronauts. They're not there to recover the astronauts. They're there to recover, recover the RTG if the mission aborts and get a re-entry. Because there was a critical window in the launch sequence where the RTG could burn up. And that would not have been good. That would have Quite fruitful for plutonium or the other apps from all of that. Okay, so the Iran agreement, we're almost done. JCPOA, is the IEA up to the task? Well, so far they seem to have been up to it. But remember, you're not going to get the US inspectors in there, you're not going to get people in. And who does the inspection? Well, you know, some of you might become inspectors. But if you're a US citizen, you're also becoming an inspector on pretty few minutes because it's very difficult to get a job in the agency if you're a U.S. citizen. It's conversely easy to get a CFE job, a cost-free expert, because we will fund cost-free experts and the agency won't turn it down. But if you want to be a regular agency employee, it's a little bit difficult to be a U.S. citizen. So that's all I have to talk about. Questions? Comments? How do you get a job at the IA? How did you become a JPA, junior professional officer? One of the things about the agency is what kind of anti nepotism rules. It's very difficult if you're a junior to stay more than seven years. Most people start out with an initial one or two year contract. And I've literally been in people's offices and said, okay, there was like one guy's office. And I said, well, it's getting towards the end of the day. Let's, let's meet tomorrow. And he said, I'm not sure I'm going to be here tomorrow. So you're going to travel. No, my contract runs out today. And he hadn't heard about his contract. And the phone rang and answered the phone and said, Oh, thank God. He got his contract. So we'll see you tomorrow. But you know, things are a little it's a little strange. And what you do with people that you like is you find a place to stash them for a year and then you rehire them. You know, they gap them for a year and say, stay away from the agency, don't do anything with us. Come back, we'll get you back in. But it's a great place to work. Come on. Do you think you could say anything about the role of the IEA 
in the Iraqi inspections and search for their nuclear? Yeah, uh, part of that, the agency played a role, but UNSCOM was the agency that was set up to really do that. And they brought in, uh, for example, George Anselon, who, by the way, as you all know, uh, was one of the inspectors. They brought in inspectors from basically from the weapon states to look at things. And there was some lack of coordination. Uh, I remember being told a story. I was not involved personally. I was, uh, I was practicing law at the time. I uh, uh, was told they had a briefing after they'd been there for quite some time. And one of the intelligence agency people stood up and he said, anybody know what these funny looking things are? We call them capstans. And one of the Livermore inspectors went nuts and he said, those are the things for winding coils for the electromagnetic units that we've been looking for for the last six months. You know, why haven't you told us about this? So it's not the, but they found us. If you want to read a kind of weird but interesting book, uh, there's a book called The Bomb in My Garden, which is about one of the Iraqi weapons people who uh, actually hid centrifuge stuff parts in his garden and then dug them up when, when the Americans came. But he talks about it. I've talked to him personally. He talks about uh, Saddam's sons who ran the program, which one I can't remember which one, who's they or who I ever really think is where I can't remember. Uh, and they were sent out, taken out of their facilities and sent out the facility and said, look, uh, you guys either do this and get it done in this time frame, or we're going to kill you and your family. He said, that's a very good motivator to, to work hard. Uh, they spent a lot of money. The technology was top notch. And they had some difficulties. But Tuatha, when we finally invaded, uh, they did a very bad job of handling stuff at Tuatha. They basically, the army ran through Tuatha and then went on, and people went into Tuatha and scavenged barrels that were then containing uh, yellow cake. They just kind of dumped out most of the yellow cake and used them for storing water because of nice big uh, barrels and things like that. Not a good recovery effort at first. Of course, they were interested in kind of winning the war and making sure the Republican Guard didn't do anything bad. But uh, I'm not sure I can address it. And what was the rationale of setting up UNSCOM for that mission rather than uh, I, I think, I don't know that there was a, I think there was a feeling that the IAEA had somewhat failed in its mission to discover all that. <laughs> they needed more than that. You will find this, maybe this is how much a shock to some of you. The IAEA really doesn't have people who have a lot of weapons on uh, When I was there, I think that was one of the reasons I got to play with safe arts, because I had some weapons background. And uh, they had one guy who was a Brit, and uh, my boss used to refer to him as the nuclear ferret, because he was he was kind of their go-to guy for anything about weapons. And occasionally they get weapons questions, but they're not. The, the typical inspector is someone who has some technical skills, some usually an undergraduate or maybe a master's level degree in some technical field, not necessarily nuclear engineering or physics. And they've gotten a job there. They're trained down at ISPRA in Italy uh, as to how to be an inspector, and they go off and inspect. They're not they're not weapons people. They don't they don't know what to look for weapons wise. Now some of them are a little more sad. You can read uh, oh, it's Robert Kelly, he's a super He's the last chat. And he'll he publishes stuff occasionally about the difficulties with IAE inspectors. So I think the reason was they really wanted some people who knew what they were doing. Weapons, weapons people. I tried to get uh, my old boss a little more. Jay Davis was part of Jay Davis was not a long time. I had J.D. was speaking my class down in Monterey. He's retired and he's not doing it anymore, but he used to have a talk. He's called the Indiana Jones Talk. Yeah. Great. Uh, he it was very exciting. He's, he's the guy, he's the guy with the caps. Yeah. He right. said, you know, he said, I want to grab the guy and strangle. Yeah. I've been looking for these things for months. Yeah. Uh, J. Davis was the uh, uh, at Livermore, he was known for collecting accelerators. Anybody got an accelerator that's going out of commission, J. Davis would try to get it. Either to Los Alamos or to Livermore, and get it, find some useful use for the accelerator. It's cool stuff. The lady question. Uh, can you say anything about the role of the IAEA to facilitate 
non-nuclear weapon state use of nuclear energy? Well, that's, that comes under primarily technical cooperation. And, and they have big programs, and they're regionalized. So TC breaks down into regional areas. So there are programs in Africa, there are programs in the Middle East, and I've said it on some of their conferences, I've said it on some of their meetings, um, and they're developing not only educational materials, and in fact, there's a there's a group called INSIN, uh, International Education something other. I'm a member of that, they don't remember but it's basically a group of educators educating people in various aspects of, of nuclear stuff. Uh, so technical cooperation is a, is a big player, but it's not in the safeguard, safety, and security area. It's, it's more medical-oriented use of radiation and uh, uh, crop technology, uh, fruit fly sterilization, things like that. And they do a whole bunch of other things. Uh, I've gotten involved with a little bit of their stuff recently because uh, a couple of us have been looking at alternatives to uh, radioactive uh, devices, that, well, devices such as blood irradiators, which can contain large amounts of radioactive materials. And this is not great because they're in hospitals and places that don't have a lot of security, so you worry about them being sold. And the IAEA supplies some of those. And sometimes they supply, for example, for cancer treatment, Sometimes in the same country, they'll supply a season 137 irradiator, and they'll also supply a Linac. Linacs are fine. Turn them on, you get, get radiation, turn them off, there's no radiation. Uh, and so we've been working with some other people to try and come up with more uniformity in how they supply. But there are reasons for supplying still the radiation source. The Linacs require stable power supplies, they require a lot more care and feeding. Technicians, there's a big brain drain. People get trained as a technician in some underdeveloped country, and they have a marketable skill, so they don't stay around. They go someplace where they can get a better job, take their family, do better for themselves. So, I mean, these are all policy considerations you really have to consider in the real world. You know, you give somebody a Linac, that may not be the biggest blessing in the world. They may be better off with a season of reading or a cobalt 60 degree. Yes, sir. So if the IAEA were to decide that they wanted to add a new environmental monitor, for example, are they required to notify the state, or is that something that they just have the ability to do by the agreements? I don't know the answer to that. I don't think that they have to notify to get approval for it. But I think as a matter of course they would notify, particularly if it has some potential effect. Uh, it's hard to understand the I mean, I've been in meetings where people have been talking about the IMS for the CPBT and people getting irate. You know, why are you putting these things in my country which are irradiating people? And they're talking about seismic monitors. You know, I mean, it's, it's, the lack of knowledge is, is really kind of tragic in some places. Yes? Obviously, it is funded. Uh, is the single states or is it states? contribute to it. The U.S. has historically been a slow payer, although one of the largest payers. Uh, and it depends on where you're at in the agency. For example, nuclear security got a lot of its funding not from the regular budgetary process, which is collection from all the member states, but from the nuclear security fund, which was voluntary contributions by member states. So our director, who at the time I was there, was Anita Nelson, who was from Sweden, and then it was Kamar Rabbit from Morocco, the director spent a lot of his or her time out hustling for funds. And some of those funds came with, came with strings attached. I mean, we might get 20 million euros. God, that's great. Except the 20 million euro came with strings attached and was only used for training in sub Saharan Africa or something like that. And you couldn't, you couldn't get around it. I mean, sometimes we get people, there, there's a lot of weirdness that goes up. I spent some time going to Ukraine again next month. I spent some time in the Ukraine. Uh, the Swedes and Finns set up some portable monitoring vans, which they wanted to contribute to Ukraine, which was great. And the vans were worth uh, probably half a million dollars, quarter million to half a million dollars. I don't know exact numbers. Except that the Ukrainian customs people wouldn't let them in the country. They wanted to extort taxes from the providers. And the, 
The pin said, we're not paying taxes on this stuff. We're trying to give you this equipment. And if you don't want it, just tell us. And so the workaround was to have it, give it to the agency, and then we gave it to them and got around the customs. I've seen things in Africa where I went and I said, well, what happened to all that equipment we gave you a couple of years ago? Oh, it's great. Well, how's it being used? It's all in the store. And they're waiting to uh, see who will pay them, pay that agency to get the equipment. And all the batteries are dead. Not the greatest system. It is. There's the real world, and then there's the ideal world. You know, two sometimes match up. Any other questions? I think I'm pretty much about time. Yes. Uh, what's the relationship like between the IEA and the CTUTO? If you have information you're saying it's mostly confidential, but if there's like permanent information that they share, they will not share it. That is an absolute no-no. I mean, that's a silly word to use. That's absolutely for reason because it's an agreement between the state and the agency, and they won't violate that. We have a similar agreement in nuclear security with, for example, the illicit trafficking database. And the way we would handle that, when we got some information that the state said, don't release to anybody else, if we thought it should be released, we would go back to them and say, hey, would you like to reconsider this? Because, and here's why we think you should reconsider it, because you know, you lost a big source and the people in the next door country might like to know you lost a big source because you know where it is, like in their country. And sometimes that would be successful, but most of the time it was like, no, didn't you hear us the first time? We said not to release the data. But the agency, the only way the agency can comply, one of the things we haven't talked about is the agency works primarily by consensus. And I run technical meetings with 70, 80 member states attending technical meeting, a couple of people from each. These things cost maybe 300 or 400,000 euro for one meeting. And you're discussing a document which was carefully developed by experts and experts from various states, who, some of whom are represented by the groups coming. Do you think they send the people who know anything about it? No, it's the people who you know, are politically in the right power structure to be able to get a free trip to Vienna. And maybe they've read the document on the airplane, uh, but you know you can destroy a whole thing trying to seek consensus that way. Uh, a lot of a lot of strangeness there, but it's that is the international environment, and if you want to deal in that environment, you have to understand the rules and you have to learn how to play the game. And sometimes you do well in playing the game, and sometimes it's a little frustrating. But overall, it's a great place to work, and. I'll tell you the one thing that I really think that I really did in my five years at the IE, I was there from 2007 to 2012. I am fairly sure that I saved some cows in a remote area of Nepal. <laughs> okay. This is an area that you can only get into six months of the year. Nepal was not an IEA member, but they came to a meeting which I was running in Sri Lanka. And they said, we think that we have cows that are sick from radiation poisoning. And their evidence was they had taken dosimeters, or radiation dose measuring equipment, and they put them on the backs of the cows. And the ones that were sick showed higher radiation readings than the ones that were well. Of course, the ones that were well were standing up, and the ones that were sick were laying on the ground. And the radiation they were reading was background radiation from the ground. <laughs> so this was not very good, but I was able to get them, we actually in technical cooperation have some veterinarians, and I was able to get some interest at UC Davis from veterinary school, and they worked with them to find out that their diet was deficient and to get them proper diet supplements so that you know the cows were well. So I did accomplish something in my five years. Hi. Okay. That's enough.